If you've got as far as opening up YouTube, you probably know enough about the 21st century to be aware of the Walt Disney Company's appeal on a global scale. But do you know exactly how the corporation makes most of its money? Or why so many other franchises are now available on Disney Plus? And why did Walt Disney refuse to give up on his idea of helping millions of children's dreams come true? Here's how it happened. Walt Disney himself was a keen cartoonist from a young age, drawing for his high school newspaper in Chicago, often depicting patriotic images from the First World War. After taking up several artistic courses and positions at unsuccessful advertising businesses, Walt set up his own animation company with colleague Fred Harmon. In 1921, they produced six laughograms, short comedy cartoons commissioned by the local Newman Theatre. The success of these laughograms led to the creation of the Laughogram Studio, through which the pair hired more animators, including Fred's two brothers and another of Walt's former colleagues, Ub Iwerks. Unfortunately, the Laughograms alone weren't profitable enough to keep the company afloat, and so Walt produced the 12 minute film Alice's Wonderland, based on Lewis Carroll's 1865 novel. The short film was too little too late to redeem the studio's financial fortunes, with bankruptcy declared in 1923. Walt moved to Hollywood following the company's collapse, where he established the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio alongside his older brother Roy. The new studio agreed a contract with Winkler Pictures, who had just lost the rights to Felix the Cat, for the production of further episodes of Alice's Wonderland. By 1926, the company's name had been changed to the Walt Disney Studio, and the Alice Comedies were retired the following year. Disney's new star was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, for a series of short animated films distributed by Universal. As Oswald's popularity began to grow, the Disney Brothers met with Universal to negotiate a more competitive contract. Sadly, their proposal was rejected, and they learned that Universal held all intellectual property rights to the Oswald character. The brothers left the meeting not only without an agreement, but also without any rights to the reproduction of their own animation. Not easily disheartened, Walt and Roy devised a new protagonist for their work, Mortimer Mouse. But on the advice of Walt's wife, who worked at the company, the mouse's name was quickly changed to the more inviting Mickey. What followed in 1928 was the first cartoon to ever feature a fully synchronised soundtrack, Steamboat Willie, in Mickey's full debut alongside his love interest, Minnie Mouse. The film was premiered at New York's Broadway Theatre, and received worldwide acclaim for a technology that had never been seen before. Walt Disney Studios was officially registered in 1929 as Walt Disney Productions Limited, 60% of which was owned by Walt, and 40% by Roy. After three years of production, Disney's first feature-length film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, was released in 1939 and became the highest grossing film of all time. Such was the popularity of Snow White that the studio was able to finance a 50-acre complex in Burbank, California. The next few years saw the release of several classics, including Pinocchio, Dumbo and Bambi, with the studio averaging around five feature films per year. Disney continued to produce more all-time classics throughout the 50s and 60s, like Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians and Mary Poppins, which took home five Academy Awards. 1953 was a year of particularly heavy investment for the studio. It had become worth Disney's while to form their own distribution networks, which came in the shape of Buena Vista Distribution, and a 160-acre site was purchased in the Los Angeles suburb of Anaheim to host the very first Disneyland Park, which opened two years later. Disneyland welcomed one million visitors in its first year, eventually receiving 10 million guests per year by the early 70s. It quickly became clear that Disney's potential was much more than just a film studio. Walt never managed to see Disney's success in the late 20th century, sadly passing away from lung cancer in 1966, leaving Roy to take over as CEO of the corporation. The construction of a second Disney park was already well underway at a site chosen by Walt before his death. Market research studies had found that only 5% of visitors to the Californian park were from east of the Mississippi River, despite that area hosting three quarters of the country's population. As a result, Walt had chosen a 20,000 acre site in Orlando, Florida as his target destination. The park was opened in October 1971, under the name Walt Disney World in honour of the company's late founder. Roy himself died less than three months after the opening of the second park, leaving the business in the care of executives Card Walker, Don Tatum and Ron Miller. Of course, the trio refused to rest on their laurels, quickly overseeing classics like Robin Hood and The Fox and the Hound. 
as well as dipping their toes into science fiction with the likes of Black Hole and Tron. Live action was starting to become a more prominent theme in Disney's work, with the more adult orientated releases of Something Wicked This Way Comes and Splash. The 80s also saw Disney's first collaborations, joining forces with Paramount Pictures to produce Dragon Slayer and Popeye starring Robin Williams. In 1983, the Disney Channel was launched on a subscription basis, which not only helped generate revenue, but also gave the brand a near-constant presence in millions of American homes. Later that same year, Disney opened its first park outside of the United States, this time in Tokyo, Japan. Another roaring success, the 30 million strong population of Tokyo loved the new theme park, which within a decade of opening received an estimated 140 million visitors, more than the entire population of Japan itself. Not content with its current status, Disney poached some of the most talented names in entertainment, bringing in Paramount Pictures CEO Michael Eisner and President of Warner Brothers Frank Wells. The Walt Disney Company was starting to become a giant of all entertainment, not just children's animations. They formed a new distribution label in 1984, Touchstone Pictures, responsible for movies like Pretty Woman, Armageddon and Pearl Harbor. This was followed by the acquisition of Miramax in 1993, which released Oscar winners like Pulp Fiction, Goodwill Hunting and Shakespeare in Love. Disney then purchased the American broadcasting company ABC in 1996, also giving them custody of the firm's 80% share in sports network ESPN. The move explains why we've seen so many Disney-themed nights on shows like Dancing and Skating with the Stars. But for all their success in other industries, Disney had only produced a handful of mega-hit cartoons since the 60s, ranking last at the box office compared to other major studios like Universal, Warner Brothers and Columbia Pictures. After commercial failures like The Black Cauldron, Disney's animation department was on its last legs. That all changed under the stewardship of new chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg, who has been credited as the brains behind the 1990s Disney renaissance. This period during the 90s is often considered as the major turning point for Disney towards achieving the iconic status that the company holds today. The decade comprised of 10 critically and commercially acclaimed films, most notably The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin and The Lion King. So successful was this period that Katzenberg stepped down from his role at Disney to found DreamWorks Animation, producer of films like Shrek and How to Train Your Dragon, as well as launching unsuccessful short-form streaming platform Quibi over 20 years later. It was also during this period that Disney collaborated with a computer animation studio you may be familiar with called Pixar, which was owned by its majority shareholder, Apple outcast Steve Jobs. The Disney team was so impressed by Pixar's technology that they agreed to a contract spanning three films, which would all be financed and distributed by Disney, but produced by Pixar. The initial three-movie deal would give Disney 85% of profit from box office receipts, leaving just 15% for Pixar. A new contract was agreed in later years that was better balanced before Disney eventually bought Pixar for $7.4 billion in 2006. Jobs' majority share in Pixar meant he was entitled to a 7.1% share in Disney, making him the single largest shareholder and so was appointed to the Walt Disney Company's board of directors. With Pixar under its belt, Disney's next target was Marvel, which was acquired in 2009 for a fee of $4 billion. The purchase took place shortly after the inception of what we now know as the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a franchise that has since sold countless comic books, spawned over 10 unique television series, and generated $20 billion from box offices worldwide thanks to its feature films. Another transaction of $4 billion also gave Disney ownership of Lucasfilm in 2012, the studio behind both the Star Wars and Indiana Jones franchises. In 2019, Disney made one of the biggest acquisitions of all time by purchasing 21st Century Fox for $71 billion. The deal gave Disney the rights over Fox's television and film studios, cable channels FX and National Geographic, and even Fox's shares in Hulu, which made Disney the new majority shareholder. Disney's roster now boasted global brands like The Simpsons and distribution rights over some of the world's top-rated movies, including Slumdog Millionaire and 12 Years a Slave, amongst hundreds more. Ownership of such a wide array of studios has paved the way for the company's streaming platform, Disney+. Plus. The online service was launched in 2019 and has proven to be an outstanding success. Within a year of its debut, the service has attracted over 60 million subscribers and continues to grow every month. 
paying members have access to content from Disney itself as well as Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars and National Geographic, while the popularity of recent hits like Wreck-It Ralph, Frozen and Moana have also proven that their animation department is far from dead. For all these assets in the entertainment industry, Disney actually generated the largest share of its revenue from its theme parks division last year a cool $26.2 billion. This will in no doubt be thanks to the contribution of its newer parks, specifically in Paris, Hong Kong and Shanghai. Although the profits from this area may have collapsed recently due to the global pandemic, there's every reason to think that these figures will be back up in the future. And when they are, it'll be interesting to see whether Disney Plus can catch up with its resort franchise, and even to see which industry the corporation might take on next. And that's how it happened. Thanks for watching.